welcome everyone to another episode of Behind the Pen. I'm your host, Karina Gantis, CEO of Author Assist. Author Assist helps authors with their marketing promotion and making sure their book has the best chance of getting up those Amazon charts. Today, I have a very, very special guest with me. His name is the one and only Harry Turtledove. Welcome to the show, Harry. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you here. You're looking very, very well. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I love all the books behind you. Is is this your office or is this like a backdrop? No, this is my office. They're, are they collectors? Are they like, they look no, very this, old. This, 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 this is, uh, I call it the study, they're reference books. Right, okay. Well, we know what you reference and what you research about, but for those that don't know who you are, um, you've been referred to as a master of alternative history. <laughs> I'm a publicist, I think, but I'll take it. <laughs> I think it was Publishers Weekly, actually, that labelled you that. Um, you've won plenty of awards, including uh, the beautiful Hugo uh, Book Award. Uh, you've been nominated for nearly every science fiction award out there. Um, why that genre? That's the first thing I want to ask you. Why that genre? Well, I found science fiction when I was, I don't know, maybe eight years old at my elementary school library. And there were these books, you know, The Enormous Egg about the chicken that hatches a dinosaur. And, the, you know, the Mushroom Planet stories and stories like that. And then when I got into junior high school at the start of the 1960s, I found Andre Norton and Robert A. Heinlein, and I was hooked forever. And a few years later, I started trying to write the stuff, and eventually I started selling it. <laughs> you make it sound so easy, but you, you missed out that you're an academic as well in the I'm field. I'm a state academic. Okay, okay. <laughs> but you've always loved anything to do with history. That's correct, yeah? Well, my my original intention was probably to become an astronomer. And I got into the California Institute of Technology to start my college career. And I flunked right out at the end of my freshman year because calculus was tougher than I was. You had to and, do calculus and, to do astronomy. Wow. Well, and... Uh, I was looking for something else to do, and because of science fiction, I had read a book called Less Darkness Fall by L. Sprague de Camp, which is a Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court kind of story that drops a modern archaeologist back into Italy in the 6th century AD and has him try to improve things according to his lights, and some of it works and some of it doesn't, and I got hooked trying to find out how much Sprague de Camp was making up and how much uh, was real. And most of it turned out to be real. And I got hooked on the field itself. Years and years later, I got to tell de Camp what he was responsible for. <laughs> you actually really did. You you spoke oh, with yeah. him. He yeah. Oh, oh yeah. wow. He that must changed. have been thrilling. It was. Uh, he changed my entire life. If I hadn't found that book in that secondhand bookstore right about then, let's see. I wouldn't have studied what I studied. I wouldn't have written most of what I've written. I would have written something because I already had the bug, uh, but I, it wouldn't have been that. Uh, I wouldn't be married to the lady that I'm married to because I met her when I was uh, teaching at UCLA while the fellow under whom I'd studied had a guest gig in Greece. I wouldn't have the kids I have uh, I wouldn't be living where I am. I wouldn't be talking with you right now about my latest book, probably. Or if I were, if I were, it wouldn't be the same book. Other than that, it didn't change my life a bit. You know? <laughs> yeah. I felt the same way. Uh, Essie Hinton was the lady that changed my life. Yeah, and if we I, all have, we all have stories like that. It's, yeah. it's what it, you know. It's what makes the idea of alternate history on the macro historical level seem more plausible because we all have these stories on the micro historical level if, if i if i could have got in contact with her like you were lucky to do with your author um i would say 
your book just changed my life and it yeah. got me that, to where I am. I so, yeah, that's and amazing. I think, was, I think he was pleased and appalled in about equal measure. <laughs> I love it. So I, I, I have had a, I have had three or four people over the years tell me that I inspired them to study Byzantine history. And knowing that once you study Byzantine history, there is a pretty good chance you've made yourself permanently unemployable. <laughs> Not <laughs> quite. <laughs> but... I understand that mixture of pleasure and horror at the idea. <laughs> Yeah, it's not an easy subject, is it? Uh, one of my one of my friends uh, is a big fan of yours, and when I told him that I was interviewing him, I asked him what his favourite because he every, he listens to the audio books. I asked mm -hmm. him what his favourite one was, and I think it's Guns of the South. He said that's probably my best known book. Yeah, that's, that's... is that the one with the cover with the Uzi on the front with the with the AK forty seven. Yes. Oh, right, the AK forty seven. Yeah. Tell you. That was not a book I ever intended to write. I, I got the idea entirely by accident because back at the end of the 80s, uh, I was friends with, a, and still I am friends with a fine fantasy author named Judith Tarr. And Judy and I wrote back and forth. This was before either one of us had email. And she was doing one of the things that writers do when they talk with other writers, she was complaining about the cover art for a book she had coming out. <laughs> she um, said, this is as anachronistic as Robert E. Lee with an Uzi for Christ's sake. And I looked at that, that was it? and I thought, that's a na nice line, Judy. And I wrote back to her and I printed out my letter. And at the bottom of my letter, I added a handwritten PS. Who'd want to give Robert E. Lee an Uzi? Time traveling South Africans, maybe because this was before apartheid had ended. If I write it, I'll give you an acknowledgement. And I wrote it, and I, the acknowledgement is in there. And that was the book that let me quit my day job. So I wow, tremendously. Yeah, and that's the one that my my friend uh, uh, named straight away as one of his favourites of uh, of yours. So thank you for me, please. I will, I will. I know he'll be he'll be watching this. Um, so the bug, when did it hit you, Harry? Oh, the new one. No, the bug, the writing bug. Oh, the bug. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I don't know. I. I first tried to write a novel, I think, when I was 14. I first finished one a couple of years later. Um, I would write during summer vacation from school, and, you know, and I would, you know, and about the only time in the past 60 years when I haven't written regularly was my first few years in graduate school because I was do I was working too hard on other stuff. Have you always been creative then? Have you always had a wild imagination? Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know how else to answer that. <laughs> but, but I mean, what was it that got you, especially writing your first book? Um, where did you get inspired? Was it from TV? Was it from other books? Was it, was it from, from life? It was, it was from other books. I've always been a print junkie. I love that. I love that print junkie. <laughs> so, so tell me before we go uh, and talk about your latest uh, book, uh, Wages of Sin. Um, tell me about your first book. Oh, my first book was a sword and sorcery novel called the first book that sold. Yeah, it was a sword and sorcery novel called Wear Night, and it sold just about at the same time as my first. Marriage was going up in flames, which was interesting. <laughs> Everything uh, happens for a reason. And uh, when I sold it, the publisher said, Harry Turtledove is a very improbable sounding name, which I know it is, but it, but it happens to be my real name. So we're going to rename you. We're going to call you Eric Iverson. So my first book came out under the name Eric Iverson. Uh, I kept it for a while. I added a middle initial. I added a G in the middle. 
it stood for goddamn. That was your sort of, yeah, <laughs> nod to the, the publishers. Business. <laughs> and I thought it might be useful. I could publish academic nonfiction under my real name, and I could publish my science fiction under the pen name. Hmm. Then I sold Lester Del Rey four books of Byzantine-based fantasy, which really made me a writer just doing them. Yeah. And Lester said, you know, if you want to stay Iverson, I don't think I'm going to buy these. We're going to change you back to Turtle Dove. People will remember it. I see. I've, been, I've had Turtle Dove as a byline ever since. And I'm probably the only author running around more or less loose who has had both his pen name <laughs> and his own name imposed on it by force you've had a few though uh, pen names not just the ivan you've had a, a few others is it because you've Who's changed the... genre maybe no the... excuse me um you you what are the reasons you you have a pen name is if you have two stories running in the same magazine in the same issue they will you know one of them will be under a pen name ah. uh, and another one is you know, if uh, you want to try something different that's out of your, your your usual genre and that probably won't sell as well, but that you can still, you know, you want to do it. So that's how I have a historical novel under the name H.N. Turtletaub, which is what the family name was before my grandfather anglicized it. Or you could tr try them and see if you can, you know, get yourself big with the pen name where you didn't get quite to the size you wanted to with your own name and mm. you know if there are a few authors who have succeeded at this i was not one of them so I'm <laughs> well you. you got famous with your own name so that was that was the that was best because i mean who who has a name like harry turtle though it's it's so unusual it's 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 it belongs to you. It you belongs know, up, to your up until, up until recently, I was the other Harry Turtledove because I had a first cousin who was 20-odd years older than I am who was also Harry Turtledove. But he wasn't an author. Uh, he was published, but he wasn't mostly an author. He was mostly an advertising man. <laughs> uh, just uh, going back one second, to, uh, you said that um, you you um, had that uh, – you doing the academic books with your real name. How many books of those did you um, bring out before you? I, I, pub I published one mm -hmm. uh, and I published four academic articles under my name, you know. Okay, what was the book about? It's a translation of a ninth century Byzantine chronicle. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you really so have to have- print. 40 years later, it's still in print. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. It's probably the book that people go to for that uh, historical. There, well, that's that's because of the the author I was translating, not because of me. I don't know. Yeah, I know, but it's still you have to do a lot of research for any kind of historical book, whether it's um, academic or fiction, oh, uh, which of course you do uh, and which you love. Um, it's working. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, your latest book now. Uh, Wait, I just soon as... happened to have a copy with oh, me. So I'm oh, sure you do! Pretty, Yay! Scottish. It's, it's beautiful, and it's set in uh, the 1850s in England, yes. where HIV got loose in the early 1500s, That's and correct. it's what life is like now in the 1850s after that. Yes, I mean, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, what would life be like when the need to be extremely careful about whom you mess with runs headlong into the urge, frankly, to screw, you know, which we have. And that was what the story was about. And, you know, how do you set limits on desire how do you set limits on expressing desire without you know risks and you know and 
people are going to take risks and what happens when they do. And Were there condoms those in that day and age? Did they create something that's similar to condoms to have uh, that protection well, the, the, for the, the guys? The, the tech the tech wasn't there until you got vulcanized rubber, and that does not exist in this world. Wow. You know, I mean, you know, the, there were such things as lambskin condoms, but those transmit the virus. They don't block it. it wow. Because you can, I can just, I mean, the 1500s, there was no kind of um, health care at all uh, for any diseases. Or in the 1850s for that matter. Well, yeah, but I mean, the 1500s, even worse, there was just, everyone died from a cold, you know, there was nothing to to help people with anything so i can just imagine by the 1850s that half of the planet must have been wiped out by hiv that's more that's more or less what we're talking about yes wow wow it just it, it just blows my mind that the kind of uh, world that you would have created using that what if and that's what all your books are they are what if that's, and to come all, up that's, with that's, these that's, that's, that's pretty much all any book is you know <laughs> no no but yours is just like because you twist things it's like what if this history was actually well, this happened in this history and it sort of blows your mind thinking yeah well, what could have happened if that really you know, one of one of the fun things about writing alternate history you know any work of fiction is not about the world you're creating it's about the world you're living in and what alternate history does is give you a funhouse mirror to look at the world you're living in that you really can't get with any other kind of fiction that i know of so you don't put yourself in that era that you're writing about in the book. Well, you it, think of it, it as the world you're in now, as if that was that time. No, you 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 can you can write about the the distant past, but the things that you have to say about it, the things in it that you think are particularly important, all of that stuff is a reflection of you now. Right. You know, when when you think about how were women treated and of course the answer is badly which is one of the major points of the book um you know somebody who's living in 1850s england who doesn't happen to be a woman i mean it's water to a fish well of course women are treated that way you know mm -hmm. and you just try to do the best you can with making it interesting convincing maybe if you're lucky may even making it thought-provoking Oh, well, I'm I'm mind blown just uh, just thinking about the actual idea. So yeah, thought provoking is one uh, description I'd use for the book. But what gave you that idea? I mean, of all the what ifs and what you've done so far in your previous novels, what gave you the idea of using HIV? Was it the pandemic we've just gone through? Uh, no, because I started on the book. I started working on the book before COVID hit. Oh, wow. So that wasn't it. Um, I think probably it's that I'm old enough to remember the HIV epidemic of the uh, 1980s and 90s before we could do anything much about it. Uh, pandemic among the in the gay community, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the fellows with whom I went to grad school, died in 1986 at the age of 41, poor guy, you know, just from being in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I remember back then when it first uh, was um, known yeah. and, and the panic that ensured because of it. The um, and it was it was people were just talking about the gay community, but they didn't realize that it would be affecting normal well, uh, sexual uh, appetites. Yeah, you, you know, uh, if you look at what hap happened in Africa, that's kind of closer to the situation in my book because they're due to you know 
different hygiene standards and everything you know mm. AIDS was a disease of everybody it wasn't just a disease of gay people exactly and, yeah because those are, those are the kind of standards that would have prevailed in in that era yeah 1850s mm. so. I'm thinking like the 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 law and the the kind of lawlessness that would be happening as well because of it all. Um, and people, even knowing the risk. Are going to. Uh, they, you know, sex is sex, you know, people's appetite. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the idea of. The thing too. <laughs> the, the idea of, of um, everyone being celibate, it, it just, it whether it, you know, celibate, there's a celibate until marriage and monogamous afterwards. And yeah, good luck with all that. Yeah, monogamous. I, I mean, even now in this day and age, monogamous. What was that? Um, but um, in eighteen in the eighteen fifties, yeah. I mean, gosh, the law that must have you must have created. Yeah, um, that, that's part. That's part of what's going on, and you know, and i you know i all, all you can do is hope you made an interesting story out of whatever situation you're playing with and i hope i did oh, i'm sure you did <laughs> yeah i i can't uh, i can't wait to get to uh, involved in this uh, uh dive into this book and and, and see where you've uh, taken it because it's uh, like i said it's just the actual idea of what if it's just mind-blowing for this um so what's i mean what's next after this one what are you working on now or what's coming out next because i'm sure you're uh, working see. on a few what's coming out next uh i think the next thing that's coming out uh is a fantasy novel called city in chains in a fantasy world that's sort of based on paris between 1940 and 1944 okay so fantasy in 1940 1944 in Paris. Mm. Uh, well, it's it it looks a lot like Paris. It's based on that. It's 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 a fantasy world. Lovely. And, what's what's the world called? Well, it's called the world. You know. But, uh, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I don't have to wait for that one. Then I do uh, love fantasy. <laughs> I, I love I love yeah, writing yeah. fantasy. I love reading fantasy because it just when you're writing it, everything and anything is reality because well, there's if, there's it, no it's, holes it's reality if you can make it interesting yeah yeah of course yeah, of course if you can make it fit in with the rest of the world you're writing about that's it i mean anything you 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 want to um, create uh can be can exist in this world because it's fantasy no one can say it doesn't and that no. just allows your imagination free ride. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic genre to write in. Yep. So is this first of, of, of a new series by any chance? No, this, or is this... This, this one is a standalone. I, I, also, I also have a collection coming out next year that's called Other People's Playgrounds. It's stories that I've written in universes that other authors have created. You know, this is what we're wow. Doing. Oh. There, there, there's a story set in Asimov's Foundation universe. There's a story that is takes off from Sprague Camp's Less Darkness Fall that made me what I am today. There, you know, there, 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 there are others. How exciting! That, 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 that was fun to put together. I've, I've, I've got to do the uh, galley proofs on that. Probably when I get off talking with you today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on them. <laughs> these, these are books that have stories that have meant something to you so to be able to dive into the world that this author's created and and make up your own uh yeah, plot it's, it's, that must have been it's, very exciting it, the, you know the, the story the stories were fun to do and that's you know you know what what have been one of the nice things about being a writer is that you know what you do is usually fun it, it's work <laughs> but it's fun <laughs> well yeah i mean if it wasn't we wouldn't be doing it but yeah it's uh i don't think people realize the the amount of time and effort that goes into writing a book um and writing is the easy part that's the first part it's the easy part it's after that's uh that uh 
takes even more work, especially as a self-published author. But um, you have an agent, you have uh, publishers for, for all of your books. Have you ever self-published at all, Harry? I've, 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 I've done a novella or two. I have not yet self-published a book, though that may happen. Okay, good, good. Um, so with um, Wages of Sin, um, is it going to be entered into any contests, any awards? Because oh, I, you know, I, I, ha I have to see how people receive it. So I have no the idea. subject matter but itself. If everybody, if everybody thinks it stinks. It's not going to be a contestant for an it's award. It's not going to stink. Yeah, you know that it's not going to stink. No way. Well, no well, way is that going to stink. You're a writer. You never know that. You well, never know that. I know everyone has said in this business yeah every, everyone has a taste and, and not everyone's going to like it we we know that from books but as an author you need to have that 100 percent confidence in your work before you put it out there and you know how good that book is harry i hope, <laughs> I hope. you always hope oh so um all right where can people find the new book and all of your other titles? Uh, the, the logical place to start is, you know, if, if you know, I, a lot of my stuff is in bookstores, of course. Uh, the other the other place you can find me, Amazon, BNN, Powell's Books up in Portland. Uh, those are those are good places. OK. Uh, and are all of your books available in audio as well now? A lot of them are. I don't think quite all of them are. I don't. You 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 have to understand. I don't have control over those rights. The publisher, you know, arranges those rights. Yeah. Uh, so they'd be. Would they be on Audible through uh, ACX? Yeah. Some of them are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, so uh, you're. You've got a website um, that people can go to and find out more about the, you. The, 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 the best place to find out about me is my is my Twitter feed, such as it is. I mean, Ooh, in, these, it, it, in these days of Elon Musk, it's not what it was a little while ago. But still, if you're if you're looking for me, you can find me there at H N Turtle Dove. HN Total Dove. Wonderful. And, and, and that will you I will annoy you probably, but that's <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I shall be um uh going over and uh, making sure I follow you over on there. Um and I'm sure after this uh episode airs you'll have a, a few more followers as well. Um Those would they know. <laughs> hopefully a lot of uh Oh, I mean, when does uh, Wages of Sin, when is it uh, released? The actual release date is tomorrow. Oh, wow. Well, we did this uh, interview. Oh, perfect timing. Good luck. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to be a huge, huge success. Um, and I will I'm get this. Wood. <laughs> I will get this uh, episode out as soon as we can to make sure that it um, it uh, at least aligns with the, with the release of the book. So. Great. Thank you. No, it's absolutely wonderful. Is there anything else you want to add before we leave, Harry? Well, let's see. Let me let me plug the book that came out last year, too. Please do. This is Three Miles Down, mm -hmm. which I just happened to have here by a pleasant coincidence, of course. <laughs> and it's set in 1974, 75. Okay, and it's based on something that really happened. In 1968, the Russians lost a submarine carrying nuclear missiles north of hawaii <sighs> and the cia over the next few years spent a moon landings worth of money building a ship that could bring the sub up from the bottom of the ocean because we found it where the russians couldn't <laughs> in three miles down there's a kicker to that because they sent a reconnaissance submarine down with cameras on cables, and they found out where the sunken Soviet sub was. In three miles down, they also find, a couple of hundred yards away from the sunken Soviet sub, the alien spaceship that sank the sub. Oh my gosh, I love it. I was waiting for that kicker then. I thought, no, this is this is too normal. But when, when's he going to put that twist in? Oh, perfect. Oh, wow. And how was that book received, Harry? It's done pretty well. Of course it has. Of course it has. Oh, I love that. 
I'll have to tell my friend to look out for that one. I think he'd be really interested in that one. <laughs> that's called um, three. Three miles down, because that's how deep the Pacific was right there. And that's the where the people, submarine went down, yeah. yeah. The Russians naturally thought we couldn't bring anything up from that deep in the water, and we showed them they were wrong. Yeah. And, Partially. And then and then Harry Turtle Dove gets hold of the story and throws in some aliens and a spacecraft. I love it. Oh, only only you, Harry. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Harry, for, for speaking with me uh, and being a guest on Behind the Pen. Okay. It's been an absolute thank you very pleasure. Thank for having me. I appreciate it. Believe me.